Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, good day, wherever you are in the world today. This is a 12-step workshop. My name is Herb and I'm an alcoholic. The call is being recorded. It will be edited and on Zoom within a week or two. Please join me in prayer. I'm going to put up on the screen the new version of, I hope improved version of, the set aside prayer with unmanageability. God, please set aside everything that I think I know about myself, my unmanageability, the 12 steps and you for an open mind and a new experience with myself, my unmanageability, the 12 steps, and especially you. Please join me in the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can't, and wisdom to know the difference. So we've now crossed over into the second stage of the rocket launch, the metaphor I've been using from the beginning. That first stage, getting in the rocket, and willing to be taken to a place of freedom. That's the whole point. Steps one, two, and three, I call the first stage where we experience the need for power, we experience the decision for power, and we experience the commitment to turn to find power. And we're then confronted with the work, the real work, the real meaning of willing to go to any length, as Bill points out on page 58, how it works. Willing to go to any length dash that we're, we'll be taking certain steps. Because we've come out of a lockdown, we may still be in it both addiction and unmanageability, I'm assuming the majority of people have dealt fairly effectively with their addiction prior to coming here, but there may be people who are still in the quicksand of their own addiction. Not necessarily alcohol and drugs, but some other form of substance and or process addiction. We focused on the first half of the first step to understand it and to experience it or re-experience it at least academically as we remembered our history. But the real point of step one from my standpoint is a focus on unmanageability, the second half of the first step. Indeed, powerless over reality, ineffective with regard to leading our life on our own power. And Bill calls it a spiritual arch. In step two, page 47, he introduces us to this concept, this metaphor, which he carries on through step five. We're building a spiritual arch. Well, he doesn't say it as clearly as I've said it. But I think step one is the foundation. He implies it because he says that step two is the cornerstone placed on that foundation. The cornerstone being willingness. Such a simple concept. We don't need to mean it. We just mean to be willing to Try it. And in step three, 
He continues with the metaphor, talking about step three as the keystone in that spiritual arch. The, the stone that holds the entire arch together. And then he talks about the spiritual arch again for the next and last time in step five. So he never fills it in for us. But at the end of step five, he asks us, are the stones in place, cement and mortar and sand? And I'm assuming that the cinder blocks of the arch are the components of the fourth step, resentment. We're going to look deeply at resentment for the next couple months, actually. Tonight, I'm giving sort of an overview and a context as we enter into step four, broadly and generally, and then specifically enter into the, the first component that Bill has us deal with in resentment. The next component will be fear. The next component will be sex. These are the three terms that Bill uses in the big book. Are the things that create the tension in us that takes us back to our habit of reducing tension, soothing ourselves through our addiction. That's the whole point. I hope you heard that. It's the whole point of Bill's approach to this human behavioral problem. Resentment and fear and sex create tension in us. Not sex itself, but unhealthy sex. That's a term I'll use. Bill doesn't use it that way. But this is what he means when he's talking about sex. I've added some components <clears throat> to the conclusion of step four, just from my own experience. Some of it's implied in the big book and some of it's not. Dishonesty and secrets. Dishonesty is absolutely uh, implied. In fact, they, he uses the word sometimes. I don't believe he uses the word secrets, but he certainly implies it both in the fourth and in the fifth step, shining the light into the darkness. And what's the point of all of this? Oh, good Lord. What a, what a, a lot of words, some of it implying a lot of negativity. Yeah, absolutely. But so what's the point? The point is freedom. Freedom from the addiction, the first half of the step, one. And freedom from the unmanageability, the spiritual malady. That's the human condition. The first half of the first step, I've really emphasized it, is the addict's problem. But unmanageability, the spiritual malady, is the human problem and therefore the underlying problem for addiction. Because when we don't deal effectively with the human problem of unmanageability, we return to our addiction. And he's very clear on that in the 10th step. We're placed in a position of neutrality. I'm quoting. That's not a paraphrase. It's a quote. Pages 84 and 85. We are placed in a position of neutrality. The first nine steps deal effectively with our addiction. Done, one, and done. Recovered is the word that Bill uses throughout the big book, past tense. It's right on the title page. How thousands of men and women have recovered. Ah, but he's very quick to say we're not cured. We're not cured. We have a daily reprieve. As long as we pursue, embrace our way of living, and nurture our spiritual condition. And he describes that as the proper use of the mind and the proper use of the will on page 85. The code he uses is three words, way of life. That code refers to three steps, 10, 11, and 12. As long as on a daily basis, we reduce the tension when we're disturbed with step 10, 
We sit in the presence of power in the morning or whenever it is that we wake up and plan our day and get guidance. We sit in prayer and meditation in the evening or whenever it is that we retire and do inventory to see how we did in our 10 step, how we did in our day, checking our character defects as well as our contribution. And then in step 12, operating on principles. The spiritual life is a life of principles. The human life is a life of principles. The civilized, decent human life is a life of principles. One of those principles is altruism. How can I help others? In the fellowship, it's how can I help another addict in my fellowship? But in the biggest and the biggest and the biggest of philosophies and pictures is how can I contribute to the humanity around me, not just in the fellowship, not just in addiction. We walk through this spiritual arch to a new freedom. You've seen these pictures before, I believe, the cartoon with the person at the beginning in bondage of jail as it's portrayed in the cartoon and then when the camera pulls back a little bit we look at this and we go well there's there's the reality that there is no ceiling there are no walls there is no floor but the person is still in jail because they're holding the bars in front of their face and that's all they see they're a victim of their delusion they're a victim of their delusion that they're in a prison and as long as they hold the bars in front of their face that are illusional, delusional, it's true. It's not factual, but it's true. And so we do a fourth step to identify those bars, the jails that we have placed ourselves in. Now, this may be more than you've heard before or more than you can even absolutely absorb or understand or agree to. At this point, if you've not done a fourth step out of the big book, if you've done a fourth step out of the big book, my sense is that you will have seen at least a peek at the truth of, the, of what I've been saying. But I'm going to give a broader context now. <clears throat> this is an interpretation of Bill's perspective his underlying understanding of biology and psychology, as well as of addiction. And it's, a, I believe it'll really help understand the structure of the fourth step. Who are we as human beings? Well, we're living beings that have certain organic and biologically given gifts for survival. At the very basic level, are our instincts managed by our brain stem, that first of three brains in us. I'm looking at objective human structure and the evolution of human beings to really understand the full impact of the benefit of this tool of the fourth step. Our instinct for fight is a survival instinct. Our instinct for flight is a survival instinct. If we can't fight it and we can't run from it, good Lord, hide. Freeze is a survival instinct, camouflage, chameleon. If the environment is green, become green. If the environment is blue, become blue. It's a wonderful insight, I believe, to understanding inventory and understanding ourselves. Fight. Certainly anger. That's the emotion. Excuse me. That's the reaction that comes from instincts. In the primal level of the limbic system, that second brain that all mammals have. A reaction to survival threat of fighting creates anger. Or fear when you are running or flight or dishonesty when we're hiding. For me, that was the biggest insight I got from 
understanding both psychology and biology in terms of what Bill calls instincts gone awry. He doesn't unpack it this way. But I did when I looked at it and I said, well, what does he mean by instincts, instincts gone awry? Anger held for a long period of time turns into resentment. Now, long period could be an hour or could be 24 hours. It's no less or no more than that. If you continue to be angry after your initial reaction, you have a resentment. And that word captures the meaning from the Latin sentire, meaning to feel. The RE in front of it signifies feeling it again and again and again. In 1988, when I did this work for the very first time, four years sober, I had a deep resentment was a mild term for my father. It was really a rage, despite the fact he was already dead 12 years. And I had done a lot of therapeutic work before I came into the program and some step four, step work, autobiographical, step nine work in an attempt to alleviate that deep anger, continuing with the therapy. Nothing had ever touched it. As a result of step four done twice, not just the first time, but twice, the first time I had an experience with one aspect of the resentment inventory, what I call column four, and the second time, I had a new experience with column three. Yes, it was in reverse of the way it's laid out in the book. My instinct of fight leads to my reaction of anger, leads to my emotion of resentment. This is just animal stuff. Now, in human beings, we have this chemical emotion and a memory that goes with it. So when we hold fear, it turns to anxiety. It's not a word that's used in the big book, so I'm not going to use it. I'm going to stay with the fear word. What do we do with dishonesty? Freeze is a survival instinct of hiding. I use the term the reaction of dishonesty. In human beings, it's intentional dishonesty or unconscious uh, uh, dishonesty. Bill gives us the category of sex where I discovered my dishonesty when I did the sex inventory. One of my professional colleagues gave me the name for the emotion that goes with that, which was shame. And I had a hard time dealing with it for a in the beginning, because it didn't feel like I'd never heard of it as an emotion. And yet over time, I've adopted it because that I'm a shame-based person, never feeling good enough, always feeling inadequate, always feeling less than, not fitting in. Other people will be anger-dominated. Other people will be fear-dominated. At least this matrix made sense to me and I hope it helps you understand why we're doing this work because this what's this is what creates the false self bill doesn't use that term in the in the same way but he does talk about the the actor and the director in many different places in the big book he uses that metaphor We have the ability with our mind and our will to know and to make decisions, to identify the obstacles in me, and then to identify that I'm not any more than, I'm not any less than, I'm just like everybody else. And the richness of this workshop is that you will hear it reinforced and confirmed from everybody who does this work and who shares it. It's an amazing experience that we're all so the same. Another picture, I think, to reinforce this false self concept. And I'm doing this because the fourth step identifies the mask 
that I wore that I didn't know that I had. It was like pouring sulfuric acid on that mask that melted it over the period of doing the step work. Not just step four, but five through nine was the completion of the removal of the false mask. The Hollywood storefront, we all have a biology that creates our genetics. You've seen these dolls that I'm about to represent, the Russian dolls called nesting dolls by some people in the gift shop. I had a, a woman from Russia in one of my workshops. And uh, when I was explaining this for the first time, she offered the Russian word for it, matrushka, and that means mother, which makes sense because this is my story. My family culture determined the survival instinct and the mask and the persona that I developed. My family culture, whatever that, it might not be a, a, a biological family, but wherever it is I grew up, both the external and the, and the home culture determined my reactions but also my emotions and the experiences I had determined a whole bunch of the components of the Hollywood storefront. My education and my psychological emotional reactions, the information that I got from the people around me, the schools that I went to, <clears throat> the culture that I lived in. One of my teachers talks about the core of goodness. This is the true self, this little icon here at the base of the PowerPoint. Some people call it spirit. Some people call it the human spirit. Some people call it the soul. The Buddhists call it the original face. The Christians and the Jews talk about the image and likeness of God. The New Age people talk about the spark of the divine. They're all trying to talk about what is the essence of the true self that's been covered up layer after layer after layer after layer so that we don't even know who we are. And the whole point of step, of step four is to unpack those layers so that we can, in fact, finally come up with who we are. In the uh, big book, Bill asks us to identify and analyze our self-centeredness. Well, remember what he said on page 62. Selfishness, self-centeredness is the root of our problem. Selfishness, self-centeredness is the root. Well, the fruit of the root is our survival instinct of fight translated into resentments, as I showed earlier, or fears, or sex. Those are the three components of the step four inventory. I've added this other one, including guilt and shame, words that are not in the big book in the same way that we use them in our culture today. But I feel remiss if I wouldn't bring them into the conversation toward the end of the step four making it very clear I have some special instructions at the end of step four based on my experience and my knowledge of having done these, uh, this, this step four many times as well as having heard many fifth steps. So people are prepared to bring their fourth step to what I consider to be a really nice tidy conclusion, overturning all the rocks opening all the closet doors, shining the light into all of the darkness to the best of our ability. Bill uses a very different model in step four in the 12 and 12. He uses the seven capital sins. The 12 and 12 was published in 1953. Bill had been under the mentorship of a Catholic priest a Jesuit Catholic priest, Father Ed Dowling, since 1940. 
this is clear evidence of it. This is a Catholic schema of the sources of the problems of human nature. I'm pointing it out to you because that's what it's in this in the 12 and 12 in chap in step four, chapter four. It's not a model that I use personally, so I don't have any experience with it. But I point it out because I do recommend that each one of you read the corresponding step in the 12 and 12 as a supplemental commentary of the steps from the from Bill Wilson. So let's take a look now at the book. That's the context in which I'm entering into page 63. At the very bottom of page 63, he said, next, we launched out on a course of vigorous action. The first step of which is a personal house cleaning. Pause for a minute. Pay attention to the words. After the third step, we're launching. So he's using still the rocket image, the metaphor, out on a course of vigorous action, not just action, vigorous action. And you'll know that's one of the literary styles of the big book. Bill Wilson usually puts a word in front of a word like that to give it a jackhammer, high steroid influence, rigorous honesty vigorous action. Pay attention to the way he tries to give it some extra energy. But the course of vigorous action are steps four through nine, and I know that by reading the next phrase. The first step of that course of vigorous action is a personal house cleaning. Oh, step four is only a component of the entire course. This is my interpretation. It's not what Bill says here, page 64, which many of us had never attempted. I had done a lot of inventory in the monastery. Every month we had a weekend that we would use for retreat to review our character defects, to use our terminology. Once a year, we had a 10-day retreat. We wrote out lots of stuff and we talked to our spiritual director about lots of stuff all the time. But it never had any real impact. I never really changed. Somehow it never became real. It was so rote. When I first came into the program, I was asked by my sponsor to do an autobiography as my step four, 1984. I did all of the steps that first year. I did an autobiographical fourth step. He didn't know much about the book and I knew nothing about the book or the step process. He said, do a fourth step, do an autobiography. That's what I did. I think it's okay. In the fifth step, it says we tell someone all our life story and all is an italics. I think it's very legitimate. And I think it actually was quite helpful to me because I was able to take a panoramic view of my entire history. It didn't help me in the way I did it at that time, but I did what I was asked to do. And I think that's the willingness that, that continued to carry me forward. I didn't see any new truth and I didn't change. For four years, I was in AA not changing. I mean, not changing my thoughts, my attitude, my feelings, and especially my behavior. I was operating in the same callous, insensitive way that I had been operating when I was drinking. In 1988, it all changed because this man gave me these instructions. Though our decision, step three, was a vital and crucial step Look up those words if you have any inclination to vital. Comes from the Latin vitae, meaning life-giving. Crucial, coming from the Latin cruce, C-R-U-C-E, meaning at the crossroads. Bill uses words very carefully, vital, crossroads. Step four is really significant. It's life-changing when done with a healthy interpretation. 
I, I almost said done the right way, but no, no, there's no wrong way to do the fourth step. No wrong way at all. No, because you're going to get something out of it. I got something out of a, a very superficial autobiography. At the very least, I was in action and taking direction. Though our decision was vital and crucial step, step three. It could have little permanent effect, which means it might have a temporary effect, step three. But it won't have any permanent effect unless at once followed by a strenuous effort. Well, we did step three as a community last week and now between then and now you prepared for step four. So you're, you're staying gently pressed up against it. A strenuous effort, hear the words again, how he gives it that jackhammer to face, meaning to know and to be rid of, meaning to take action. Remember, I introduced you to the concept of what makes us specifically human. We did that when we did step one, the mind and the will. This is a dominant rhythm that Bill uses in each of the steps, in all of the steps. All of the even steps are naming steps. All of the odd steps are decision and action steps. It's just my observation about it. A methodology built specifically for human conversion, for human transformation the rite of passage from childhood to adulthood. Bill, Bill calls it that. He doesn't use the term rite of passage, but he says step six in the 12 and 12. Step six brings the child to the adult. That's what he's referring to. Because we identify the false self, that mask that we wear, and through a process, it's removed. We don't remove it. Step six and seven are very clear about that. We're powerless to deal with it. But we are invited by a willingness to take action to connect to a power that will, in fact, create the transformation, that spiritual awakening, that change in the way we think and feel and behave that's done to us, not by us, but not without us. to face and be rid of the things in ourselves which had been blocking us. Blocking us from what? I'm reading this very contemplatively. I want to know what Bill is driving at. What does he mean? Blocking us from power. That power that is deep inside of me, that is available to me, that isn't me, but is available to me, and that cares about me. Those are all the implications of steps one through three. Our liquor is but a symptom. Have you heard an echo of that in the workshop before? Yes, addiction is a problem, but it is not the problem. Bill says it right here. Liquor is a symptom of the problem. So we have to get down to causes and conditions. This is the invitation to step four. Analytical. Bill doesn't use the word analyze. But he gives us the, all of the instructions to analyze. To get down to the causes and conditions. That's why I, I felt that slide on instincts and reactions and emotions was so powerful. Because it gets underneath the underneath the underneath to the basic biology. Therefore, we started out on a personal inventory. This was step four. A business which takes no regular inventory usually goes broke. Now he's going to use the business metaphor or analogy for uh, or the picture to give us a good reason to do this. He's a salesman. He wants to motivate us. What's the benefit to me to do all this work that he's going to put in front of us? Taking a commercial inventory is a fact-finding and fact-facing mind and will. Fact-finding, I want to know what the facts are. Fact-facing, I want to do something about it. I want to accept it. 
It is an effort to discover the truth about the stock in trade. This is not about beating ourselves up. This is not about negativity. This is not about guilt and shame. No, it's just the truth. One of the spiritual teachers from her readings, uh, Teresa Vavila, said, humility is truth. See, it's a perspective. One object is to disclose damaged or unsaleable goods, to get rid of them promptly and without regret. If the owner of the business is to be successful, he cannot fool himself about values. Be delusional. I'm going to use that word an awful lot between now and forever, quite frankly. You might want to get real clear on what is a delusion, what is an illusion, what are the differences. I think some of those uh, words are asked uh, for in the assignments anyway. I'm not looking at the assignments right now. Mm -hmm. But the point is, look at the words he's using. Personal inventory includes causes and conditions, fact-finding and fact-facing. It's an effort to discover the truth, to get rid of the damaged goods, and to identify what our values are. This is going to be a very rigorous course in basic psychology. Not that I'm going to teach you about basic psychology. I'm going to help you experience it out of the big book. We did exactly the same thing with our lives. We took stock honestly. First, we searched out the flaws in our makeup, which had caused our failure. That's not a new concept for us. On our journey these last six months, we've looked at page 52. So our troubles are uh, 62. So our troubles are of our own making. That's what he says on page 62. Selfishness, self-centeredness is the root of the problem. So our troubles are of our own making. That's all he's doing is re reinforcing it here. And you may not have that experience yet, but you will as you do these column work. We searched out the flaws in our makeup, which caused our failure, not circumstances and people, but our reactions to circumstances and people. Being convinced that self manifested in various ways was what had defeated us, we considered its common manifestations. Resentment is the number one offender. Being convinced that self manifested in various ways, self is the root, instincts are the fruit, fight, flight, and freeze. We consider its common manifestations, the fruit of the root. Resentment is the number one offender. It destroys more alcoholics than anything else. That's, that's such a powerful statement. He said, resentments destroy alcoholics, not alcohol. From it, and that, now he explains what his thinking is in saying that. From it, resentment, stem all forms of spiritual disease, unmanageability, the spiritual malady. For we have been not only mentally and physically ill. Does that ring a bell for step one? mental and physical, the first half that deals with addiction. We have been spiritually sick. Does that ring a bell? Second half of the first step, unmanageability. And then this sentence, which confirms everything I've been teaching from January till now. When the spiritual malady is overcome, unmanageability, the spiritual malady, we straighten out mentally and physically. We're not cured of our unmanageability, our spiritual malady. We have a daily reprieve contingent on leading our way of life. And if we do that, the spiritual malady is contained. We live in a flow in a, uh, behind a spiritual shield that, that protects us from the obsession that will take us back to the relapse. In dealing with resentments, we set them on paper. 
So Bill isn't going to just say, you need to discuss this with somebody. He's going to make it very clear in each component of the step four inventory, the resentment and the fear and the sex, he's going to confirm this is pen and paper stuff. This is writing stuff. In dealing with resentments, we set them on paper. We listed people, institutions, or principles. I want to talk about that today. People's pretty straightforward. I've had you make a list now or beginning to make a list of the resentments that you are aware of. It's not a memory of a resentment. That's not what we're doing. It's not looking back at your prior inventories to see what is what should be on your list. No, that's not the point. The point is for you to search your soul, your feelings, your awareness, your consciousness right now as to what anger do I have? What resentment do I have? What irritation or annoyance do I have? Those were two words that were given to me as a gift the third time, I, fourth time I went through the step work. It was the fourth time I was 20 years sober. I went through the step work and I came back to the man after he gave me these instructions on resentment. And I said, I don't have any. I don't have any resentment. And he said, well, that's right, Herb. You've had three major journeys through the steps. You are consistent with your meditation practice and your step 10 practice and your accountability with your sponsor. It makes total sense. You don't have any resentments. Try these two words. Who annoys you? Who it irritates you? I got 10 names on the phone right there because we we're always human. I am. I'm always human anyway, but I wasn't aware that I wasn't aware of the mosquitoes in my life. Right now I'm encouraging you to deal with the white shark, those 5,000 pound resentments, maybe trauma from childhood, maybe abuse from a significant other maybe a circumstance with a institution or some other kind of mischief. The big stuff, not looking at mosquitoes right now, unless that's where you're at in your own spiritual development. But it's not about a memory. For instance, I'm sitting here today, 37 years sober, and I can talk to you about my rage for my father because I have a memory of it. And I can describe it in emotional terms, but I have no emotions. I have no negative memory of my father. I have uh, feelings. I have memory, but not the feelings about it. There's been a process of giving me freedom, which I'll introduce you to, not tonight, but over the next couple of weeks. <clears throat> in terms of the way Bill lays it out, not just mine. I'm going to be very true to the big book. At the same time, I will share and expand on what the big book talks about through my knowledge of the process as well as my experience as the result of the process. People is pretty straightforward. Most of our resentments are to deal with people, especially close people to us, like family members, especially mothers and fathers and siblings. Absolutely. Especially partners, present or past. Absolutely. But I want to emphasize, this is not about a memory of a resentment. This is about having a current feeling. It might have happened yesterday, but it might have happened 40 years ago, and you still have a clenched teeth or fist or, or not in your gut when you think about that person, or if their name is mentioned, or God forbid, they should walk in the same room and surprise you. What would your reaction be? That's a resentment. Now, I, it took me a long time to find a resentment. When I, I was four years sober and the man gave me these instructions and I prayed about it, I meditated about it, and I went to my AA meetings and I called him every once in a while and said, Sean, I don't seem to have any resentments. You know, I'm four years sober. I've got all this wonderful therapeutic background. I've done lots of personal development. I don't have any resentments, he said to himself. But then one morning, I'm in my uh, 
bedroom getting dressed to go to work and I'm having some real difficulty. You'll hear more about that later on uh, with my work environment and the colleagues there. I was 20 years working there and, and there was a posse there to get me fired. And I was having real struggle of survival in my, my career. So I'm thinking about it. I'm going to have to go face the dragon today and I'm getting dressed. And I have this 30 second movie that goes off in my head. You know how we kind of play a movie to see the reality and anticipation. And the, and the movie clip went something like this. I walked up to this one person who was leading the posse. This is in the movie, in my head, in my fantasy, as I'm getting dressed in the morning to go to work, to face the dragon. And I walk in and he's standing there with this dumb shit look on his face. And I walk up to him and I pull out a straight razor and I cut his stomach open and his guts fall on the floor. And I go, oh, that's a resentment. <laughs> no, it had to be that dramatic for me to understand. Oh, that's a resentment. Well, as soon as I identified it, the dam broke and I got 85 resentments over the next week as I was making a list and checking it twice. Yeah, I had no problem once I identified emotionally. Emotions weren't very available to me in those days. Mm, people. All right, so institutions. What does that look like? Well, maybe the IRS. Maybe the uh, military of some kind that you've had a bad experience. Or maybe the Catholic Church or the Jewish uh, religion or the Baptist religion, um, the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, maybe. And I'm not talking about this Bartok stuff where we get strong feelings about it. That's not what I'm talking about. Although it might, it might qualify. I'm talking about this hardcore, deep, visceral, Mount Vesuvius, volcanic, hot rage or anger. That's the stuff I... Um, I'm inviting you to take a look at. And a lot of people say, gosh, I just, I, I don't want to open those scars. I mean, those scars are closed. That's history. I'm going to move forward. Well, there's pus underneath those scars if there's resentment. Well, I just don't want to know about it. And if you were, if your physician said, I suspect that lump is cancer, but I won't know until I do a biopsy. Would you say, yeah, no, let's not, let's, I, I, I'm afraid of the results. Well, if you don't get the biopsy, you won't know. And if you don't know, and there is, you'll die. Not facing the truth will eventually kill us in that situation. And, and here, that's what Bill is saying. These, the, and he uses, in fact, that term, the cancer of the soul. He calls this from the Oxford group experience, soul surgery. Institutions. Principles I've never had much of a connection to. I asked my step guide, well, what do you mean by principles? And he gave me an example from his life, which will tell you a little bit about him. He was 10 years older than I am and was at that time, of course. <clears throat> and so he was from a bit of a different generation, had been raised in New York and had a very different uh, lifestyle, educational style, um, family background, raising and all the rest of it. He was very different, but he came from a generation. And he said, well, when I first did this work, he said to me, I had a resentment toward equal rights for women. I mean, that's the kind of guy he was. He was a total male chauvinist back in 1988. And he had recovered from that due to this process, but that was an example for a principle. So I've, I've attempted to play with it, uh, different principles like honesty or uh, um, fidelity or integrity, uh, just to explore whether I had any type of negative energy of, and I really have never been very fruitful in that investigation. You might have some um, deep anger or um, disturbance or negative feelings about some principle. And then we'll unpack it here. 
with whom we were angry. All right. So that's the list. So I'm asking you to make a list. And don't filter it. If the name or the um, word comes to you, write it down. Don't filter it. Oh, I dealt with that. Oh, I did that in therapy. Oh, that's not true. Oh, that would be a betrayal of my family to explore my hatred for my mother. <laughs> I've heard those statements. Just put it down. Don't judge it. Don't filter it. Just put it down. I'm going to help you shape it. Number one, so that it's real. And number two, so that it's manageable. I had a guy list 500 names. I said, we're not going to deal with 500 names. We're going to deal with 10% of that. So pick 50 of the ones that have energy. And I've actually fine-tuned it with the work in the workshop to a much lower number. Somewhere between 10 and 20. That's where we're going with this. I'm not saying modify it right now. Get your list and then look at it in prayer, the set-aside prayer, and pick out the ones that are substantive for you by your standards. This is very relative work to you. By your standards, what does substantial mean? Somewhere between 10, if you have that many. Don't make them up to get to 10. But if you have that many, uh, if you have more than 20, just pick the top 20. So someplace between 10 and 20 of the names. All right? That, that'll do for column one. Because the way I do it, you'll find eventually that you can replace any name or circumstance in the dynamic and it'll all be the same. Because the central actor in every play is you. And there aren't that many variations on you. And it might be a woman, it might be a man, it might be old, it might be young, it might be 40 years ago and it might be four minutes ago. The dynamic will be the same because it comes out of your reaction to people and circumstances. I don't want to dismiss anything. I don't want to gloss over anything. I don't, certainly don't want to be superficial here. Work with your sponsor or step guide in terms of uh, guidance with regard to substance and the numbers and the minimum and the maximum. All I'm saying is for this workshop, between 10 and 20 will be plenty. If you only had five, we could work with that. And you would have a powerful experience with five, as long as they were authentic resentments and or anger for yourself. But I suggest a minimum of 10 and a maximum of 20 so that you have a repetitive confirmation of the insights that you will get with one or two when you have the same insights with 10 or 20 it's totally confirmed. It's kind of like, oh my God. The work that we're entering into is the reason I have people read and sign the participant agreement. This is the reason right here. It does create suffering. It does create embarrassment. In some instances, it might create a need to go to therapy. I'm totally confident that some of you will have that reaction to it. If it becomes destructive to you to enter into the trauma, then you need to deal with professionals and stop doing the work. But that's why I'm suggesting everybody have a sponsor, certainly that they're talking to on a transparent basis. And if you have confidence in them as a step guide to assist you with what we're doing here. That's great. And if not, engage a step guide or maybe form a small group. And we'll be talking about that here in a minute uh, of, uh, of people in the workshop that would then on the phone or Zoom or personally, physically meet in between these meetings to, as a cohort, explore from a personal standpoint this work in a, in a small uh, group for, for support. So that's column one. Today, we're gonna take a, a look at column two and have lots of conversation now about that. 
for the balance of the workshop. On page 64, his suggestions now continue. We asked ourselves why we were angry. That's the second column. Now, Bill doesn't refer to first column, second column, third column, fourth column. He doesn't use that language, but I do. Look at page 65. There's a column there under I'm resentful at Mr. Brown. I call that column one. You might even want to put that in the book at the top of the column, column one. Right next to it is the cause. I call that column two. You might want to put that in the book, column two. Right next to it is another column. I call that column three. Bill doesn't use this vocabulary, but I do. And it'll be better if you adopt my vocabulary so that when I'm speaking, you'll really understand what I'm saying. Column one are the names or the institutions or the principles. It's just the facts. Mr. Brown, Mrs. Jones, my employer, my wife, just the facts. But here's where it's really more important, and this is really my point here, my bullseye point. Under the second column, this is not therapy. This is not catharsis. This is not journaling, please. This is a focused effort to identify the facts, the truth, as Bill laid it out prior, and I emphasized it. Look at this. He's angry at Mr. Brown because of Mr. Brown's attention to my wife. How succinct is that? There's very little emotion there other than the obvious anger. And then there's the next item below that. He told my wife of my mistress. Oh my God, I'm so pissed. Right. And then there's underneath that. And Brown may get my job at the office. Well, I mean, this guy's coming at him on all scores. But notice the point is the succinctness of it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight words in the third item there. So this is not a long discussion of the trials and travails of poly victim, right? This is a capturing succinctly of why I'm angry. They betrayed me. They hurt me. They damaged me. They... What was it specifically? And the more specific you can be, the better the work that you will do. His attention to my wife, told my wife of my mistress, may get my job at the office. Those are very laser focused specifics. Now, in the book, I would suggest that you, next to his attention to put A, next to told my wife, put B, next to Brown may get my job, put C because that's the language I'm going to use from now on. Column one has the numbers. Column two has the letters. And when you're going to do the work with the worksheets that I'll be offering you, I'm assuming that you're, you've, you know what that means and you've got them in the Way of Life document and that maybe you're prepared to or already have made copies of them. And I'm not saying how many copies to make. But if you have 20 resentments on a list, you're probably going to need 60 copies. Because I'm going to suggest that you do three worksheets for each resentment. That's why I'm trying to help you shape it. If you have 20 on your list column one, and you have three in each of those for column two, three times 20 is 60. That means 60 worksheets. And there's a worksheet on column three, and there's a worksheet on column four, which means 120 worksheets. Hello, this gets really, you know, like a task. <laughs> this is real work. So um, the point of that was not to frighten you, but to warn you and to also have you prepare. Don't make 10 of the worksheets copies. Make enough and be generous, an extra 20 or 30 or 50 won't cost you that much money. <laughs> and it will be so worth it to have the, the material in advance. But now I want you to hear the assignment for next week. 
because this is as far as we're going to go right now. You have a you you have begun to prepare a column one list. Some of you may have finished it. You're going to add to that now the column two material, all on worksheets that your own, your own scratch paper, basically, because the formats that I have are the worksheets that I want you to use later on. And I'll give you, I'll begin to give you those instructions next week. But I want you to review on page 64, the balance of those instructions on 64 are column three. The balance of the instructions on page 65 are column three. You'll notice that there are two paragraphs, one on page 64, in most cases it was found, and uh, another paragraph on page 65 on our grudge list. Those two paragraphs are very similar, almost duplicates. They're not duplicates, but they're almost duplicates. There's a lot of overlap. Why would Bill be redundant? I'll address that question next week. It must be pretty important. If he says it twice, then he gives us a few more words each time or different words each time. It must be pretty important, as it turned out to be for me. But he only gives us the words. And then he lists them on page 65 in that third column. All of the words in those two paragraphs are on that third column. But they're only words. And he doesn't tell us what they mean. And he doesn't tell us what to do with it. I will make comment about that next week. If you wanted to take a look at the column three worksheet, you will see that I've used those seven words from the column three there on that worksheet. And I've given them a definition and I describe what to do with it. And next week I'll, I'll go through it in a personal example and we'll begin the assignment of actually doing that work. If you wanted to fill out a column three worksheet on your own using the worksheet and the specific definitions and instructions in the worksheet, be my guest. You could play with it. It might help you next week when I unpack it personally with my own interpretation and experience with it. I'm not asking you to do that. I'm not asking you to complete a column three. I am saying though, some of you will do it because you're curious and you want to experiment with it, it's fine. I'm not, I'm not suggesting, I'm not one way or the other. I'm merely introducing you to a process that will change your life. No, <laughs> that's all. <laughs> this process will change your life uh, if you haven't done it before. I don't care if you're 20 years sober, 20 minutes sober uh, or 40 years sober. If you haven't done this work the way I'm about to introduce it to you next week, it will blow your mind. I'm not hyperbole here at all. And anybody who's on the call that's already done some of the work, you might want to share just modestly uh, about that, just to reinforce the words that um, I'm using. Please join me in this prayer because we've now entered into major transformation on steroids. Please join me in prayer. Lord, make me a channel of your peace that where there is hatred, I may bring love, that where there is wrong, I may bring the spirit of forgiveness, that where there is discord, I may bring harmony, that where there is error, I may bring truth, that where there is doubt, I may bring faith. That where there is despair, I may bring hope. That where there are shadows, I may bring light. That where there is sadness, I may bring joy. Lord, grant that I may seek rather to comfort than to be comforted, to understand than to be understood, to love than to be loved. For it is by self-forgetting that one finds it is by forgiving that one is forgiven. It is by dying that one awakens to eternal life. Amen. This is the formal beginning of the process of the death of the false self. Welcome, welcome, welcome.